So this is limbo. Oh, it's good to have a rest along the way up from hell. I'm Professor Marley, by the way. By permission of Charles Dickens and Christmas Carol, I'm now in the access carriage. Seven long years I've been down in hell, wandering around with the weight of this academic dress. And now I've been so bad that it has allowed me to go back to earth for a day, providing and provocative and all and tell them that it's not all right with access. That's what I've got to do. Not an easy job. My friend Professor Scrooge now, he's head of access at Caban Metropolitan University College. Four million students worldwide. You'd think he'd be satisfied with that for access, but no. He keeps telling me there's ever more and more to do. How am I going to persuade Professor Scrooge? Not to let everybody finish up like me, staggering round hell in chains like this. Believe me, it's hot and it's tiring, but it's nice to see you all. Now, uh, obviously, you don't want to go to hell like me, I can tell that. It's pretty grim down there. And I've got to think about how to persuade Scrooge, so I thought, while I'm resting here before the rest of my journey, I'd try out my ideas I'm going to use with Scrooge. How am I going to persuade him? I've obviously got to be academic, so I've written him a paper, and you'll find copies of that scattered around Limbo, so you can have a look at that as I'm talking. I've been seven years away from the world of HE, so I don't know about this PowerPoint thing, but it's all on here for later peruse, or nothing impresses an academic more than a paper. <laughs> now, of course, Scrooge was also, if you remember, rather scared by the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future, so I thought I'd bring him the ghosts of access, past, present, and future, because I've got to give him the messages. First, are you sure you're not trying to do the impossible? You've got to balance eight different things. I've listed those at the beginning of the academic paper. Okay. Now I can see from those posters at the back that you're trying them all. It's all a bit bitty, but there are some good national policies too, and they all work a bit, but you can't work on all of them at the same time. It's like you can't balance them all. It's just doing the impossible. Secondly, let's suppose he ever achieved the impossible and got everybody in. What then? Who on earth wants a degree if everybody's got one? Interesting thought. Because if everybody's got one, then nobody's really important anymore. It doesn't distinguish you. So why aspire to something that's cheap and easy to access? Not really worth it, is it? taking away that exclusivity. We don't really want to change that, do we? So that's sort of the main messages I've got to get over, trying to use some of the lessons from the past. So while I move on to my first ghost, you might like to have a look at a bit of the yellow paper. Excuse me, just one moment. Oh, oh that's a bit cooler. Oh. I am the young university. I am the ghost of access 1800 to 1960. During that period, you only really needed one degree to become a distinguished person, so the burden was not particularly heavy. I'm in my seventh decade, and when I attended university, I was one of only 2% to go. How nice, how exclusive, how perfect. I was not there, of course, in 1800. The ones who were there in 1800 were male, Anglican, rich, or vaguely studying for clerical and legal degrees. But by 1960, so much access had been achieved without the word even being mentioned. Isn't that fantastic? Women had come in, Roman Catholics had come in, and all other faiths and denominations as well. 
what minority ethnic groups we had were that, at that time were at least beginning to come into universities. There were masses more universities, two in 1800 in England, 31 by 1960, so lots more opportunities. Equally, there were technical colleges that were offering wonderful equivalent to degrees. Now, apart from that formal side of things, governments trusted universities. Governments knew that universities knew what excellence was because everybody in the government had been to a university. So, of course, they thought they were all right, which was wonderful. So, the universities were free, given block grants to do what they liked with. And yes, they got access, particularly, as I've said, for women who benefited greatly from all the reforms. Massive numbers of new universities were built. The other important development of this period was that even for people who couldn't get to university, they started setting up their own access routes. Working men's clubs had reading rooms. Public libraries became, in fact, the universities of the poor. Massive numbers of university lecturers from London went out and about using the new railways to spread the word. And people came to evening classes, mature students upper working class, lower middle class, social mobility assured for the simple reason that there were plenty of graduate jobs and very few graduates to fill them. So a very good pattern, but in a sense without any particular pressure at all. So let's move on then to the present, which I cover as 1960 to 2013, because this is when we began to get degree inflation as the only way to distinguish what on earth we were doing. It's such a task to get all this lot on. Sorry about this. Okay, right. This is the period when more is more and the word access comes first to be heard. This is what Scrooge is facing now and this is what I've got to, if you like, destroy. But there is a belief now that the universities no longer know what excellence is. You don't just get in on merit, you get in to fulfill criteria of social justice. In the past, you achieved something in order to get into university. The fact that not everybody could achieve that really wasn't particularly noticed. But once you get past the 1960s, certain unassailable characteristics in ourselves have to be recognized in order to achieve social justice, irrespective of whether or not you then also manage to achieve what the universities might regard as merit or excellence. Now, amongst the many things going on during this period, one of the most successful has been preparing children before they get to university. Because if they aren't properly prepared, then they're never going to apply. So you've got to get that right. And I know a lot of people are doing that in small ways. They're doing it in England. We've got Say Yes to University in America. We've got Into University in England. And I did read the name of the equivalent in Ireland, but being old, I've forgotten what on earth it is. But it was a very good idea, I thought. Same thing, mentoring of young people who've not used to going to university. So a lot of pressure goes in there, but it's a bit bitty. Depends on the personality of the teachers and their determination. So it's a bit kind of erratic however much you try and aim at particularly deprived areas. And also, of course, we've discovered in England that if you aim at particularly deprived areas, there are some people living in these areas who aren't deprived, but nonetheless get counted in as having been deprived. And therefore, it makes the figures, if nothing else, look better. We've obviously expanded with masses more universities, so there's plenty of places for access. I think we're up to about 130 universities now. They pop up all over the place. Every day, another new university. Is this really what we want, popping out of the woodwork? New universities all the time? What sort of exclusivity does that give us? Now, in order to cope with that lack of exclusivity, first of all, we convinced everybody they'd got to have a master's degree, and then we convinced them they'd got to have a doctorate. 
And indeed, some of the pressure is now going beyond the first degree. You've got to get further. This is, we're giving everybody such a burden of continuous learning throughout their lives. For goodness sake, when do we get to rest? What is this leisure time? What is the work-life balance if we have to spend all our time doing examinations and studying? The big news, of course, has also been over in America, where they've been working affirmative action or positive discrimination programs. And I hate to admit this, but it does look as if it's been extremely successful. The Ivy League universities are now very, very equal in terms of representations of groups. In fact, in some groups, they are over-representing what might be regarded as minority access groups. The only fly in the ointment now is the legal challenges from groups who have been pushed out by those who are now being pushed in because that's the next problem of access. Even with many more universities, they're not all equal as we know. If you live in England and you go to a Russell Group University, the top 20 universities, that's regarded as better than going to Lincoln University, one of the new universities, right? So you still get people saying, what about the Russell Group universities? Now, as I say, America have solved it. But the first challenge is coming now from somebody from the middle classes, somebody with parents with HE, somebody who could afford to pay for university who didn't get a place, even though her results were better than those from people in minority ethnic groups. But social justice really matters. So let's have a look at what my ghost of the future can perhaps help us with. Oh. Wow, that's better, isn't it? So it's now about 2060, and I'm looking back at 2013. Well, first of all, education really is for the mass, isn't it? Everybody's going on one of these MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses, and of course you don't need any qualifications for ENTER. But of course the universities have noticed two problems. That removes all the exclusivity of a university degree. If all it takes is a button on a computer, Really, it's not worth the bother, and you can't get a qualification from it. So now we've got SPOCs, small private online courses, for which you will have to have some entry qualifications. You still can't get an exit qualification. They haven't solved that one yet. I guess they will. Minerva moved in, of course, from 2015 onwards, whereby you had cohorts of students traveling the world, teaching each other, taught by emeritus professors online. There's always a job for the elderly, which is good to know. And uh, they didn't even have their own libraries or campuses. They used public libraries and buildings rented as each cohort moved around the world. So an interesting reflection on a combination of 19th century DIY learning and 21st century blended learning to try and get yet more people in. But the cost of that is enormous. So we're back again where we were in the 19th century. Everybody can go to university so long as it's a mass MOOC. But if you want something else, maybe we've not moved on all that far since the 18th and 19th century. And I think perhaps I would like to leave you with these thoughts just coming out of my ghostly range for the moment. Looking back over the past of access, it seems to me the most noticeable thing is that unfettered access can destroy the desirability of higher education, particularly when it is combined with economic recession. So I was having a look at the figures at the back there on unemployed graduates in Ireland, and I, it's much the same in the UK. Or at least a lot of jobs we would not previously have called graduate jobs now are. Now we can see that as a fantastic gain for the general education level of the population. Well, we can begin to wonder whether maybe did the baby go out with the bathwater? Right, so do we want to rid ourselves of degree tyranny or do we want to expand it to everybody, meanwhile, therefore, decreasing its exclusivity? 
But I guess all of us have lived in the era of wanting social justice more than anything, and it's difficult to dislodge that. But if you do, I think there are some thoughts again looking back through history. All the initiatives that are taken in those eight areas of activity will work to some extent alone or in combination. But it is extremely difficult to coordinate them and it's extremely difficult to fund them all adequately. So the best you can do is select a priority order and stick with it. The second thing is don't beat yourself up about what maybe you haven't achieved. This conference is also about what you have achieved. And it is amazing when you look back at 1800, I know that's a long while ago now, but we have come an awful long way since then in terms of access, even in our understanding of who has the right to access. It expands exponentially every day. And that's the other problem. As you admit one group, two things happen. Another group then becomes aware they could join. And another group, to some extent, becomes disadvantaged. So we're now finding that with a £9,000 fee, which largely falls on the middle classes who have enough income supposedly to pay it, their numbers of applicants are dropping. The numbers of applicants in working class and disadvantaged groups who get more financial aid has not dropped. So are we beginning to lose out on the children and grandchildren of those who had higher education? Is that what we want? It is exciting that we do open up our minds all the time. I mean, I did once list all the groups that are wanting access from the highly mobile or traveler's children, as you call them here, those with additional needs, um, bilingual children, we've got refugees, asylum seekers, everybody's got a pressure group to get them into university and you can't help but be amazed and impressed by that. But at the same time, ask yourself, are we losing the exclusivity and if we are, what can we do about it in the age of massive university expansion? And secondly, how do we make sure that in admitting new groups, we don't disadvantage the old who also still need education? And I hope that's not too provocative and too overthrowing the received wisdom. So congratulations on a great conference. It's a lovely idea. And you've got some speakers to follow who will tell you what it's really like in Ireland. Thank you for listening.